Welcome to Awareness to Action, a podcast brought to you by Northwestern Community Services Prevention and Wellness. I'm your host, Casey, a social worker and prevention and wellness specialist here in Virginia. Our goal is to bring you stories of people who are engaging in their communities in meaningful ways, to hopefully inspire and encourage you to seek those connections in your own community. Welcome to season three of Awareness to Action. We are so glad to be back. I am here today with Keith Cartwright. If you have been a listener for a while, you know that Keith was on uh, with us season one, and we did an encore episode of his in season two. Now he's here again, season three, because we're big fans of Keith. But we're doing something a little bit different today. Keith is actually going to interview me. This is something we've talked about for a little bit. Uh, I have been on the interviewing end of a lot of conversations here with Awareness to Action, and we thought it might be kind of cool to flip the script. And Keith was an obvious choice for our interviewer because, again, we're big fans. Uh, My conversation with Keith from season one is one of my favorites and one that has really stuck with me um, in my personal and professional life. So here we are. Keith, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm excited. And we are mutual fans of each (laughs) other. But personally, I just I just fell in love with our conversation Mm -hmm. in season one. It just it it was one of the more meaningful conversations I've had. And I think it was just I connected with you. Well, and I'm, I'm a big fan of just the collective podcast that you all are doing. It just speaks to the hearts that you all have for um, prevention, awareness to action is just so much of my work and my hope that as we make folks aware of a lot of the conversations you all have been having, you know, that will prompt some action that is going to promote healing and community. So I'm all, I'm all in and I, I love interviewing. So I can't, I can't wait when, when I forget who it was that, that reached out. Like it was a, like, I think I tried to, mm, I don't know, but no, it was like, I'm, I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's it. do it. So <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited too. Um, I say we just jump into it. Yeah. So I, so I get to take over now. Yeah. So you're, I'll hand you're, it over officially, to you. <laughs> you're officially on the hot seat. Um, well, you know, I like, would like, I am curious as you start season three, going all the way back to season one, when you started the podcast, what, what were some of the, like, what was the conversation like that decided, Hey, I think we need to, to start a podcast. What were some of the hopes and some of the ideas behind that to begin with? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so really our department changed a lot when COVID hit, as did every department everywhere. Um, All of a sudden, a lot of our community work was not being done in person. And so there was this sense of, okay, well, the information we're sharing, the work we're doing is important, but how are we going to reach people when before we're mainly doing that in community gatherings and now have that opportunity 0% of the time? So we started doing webinars and we did a couple little series. We had a a really great uh, one called coffee. I think it was coffee and conversations, conversations and coffee. And we were getting to talk to different people in the community where we were getting to talk about, you know, what was important for people to be hearing during COVID, like just, you know, messages of hope, how, how can you help your kids learn from home? You know, and it was just, we were touching on a lot and it, seemed to be resonating with people, but those webinars had limitations. You know, we were doing them during the daytime and there were folks who were working or were trying to teach from home for the first time. And so we just, um, you know, sometimes we'd share the recordings after the fact, but I think we all kind of felt like we could be doing this in a way that reached more people. And very early on in the pandemic, um, Shannon or Rebecca threw out the idea of doing a podcast. And I remember laughing it off like, yeah, right. We were like, we're going to produce a podcast. That's funny. Um, because the webinars felt like, you know, already, a such a learning curve. And then as the pandemic progressed, we, I don't know, I guess we just started talking about it more seriously. And then eventually it was like, well, this is something we are going to do. (laughs) And I remember (laughs) thinking like, 
well, what does that even mean? How do we, yeah. where do you start with a podcast? I don't know. You know, we, we are in the department, all social workers. Like, I don't know anything about technology. And um, Shannon is our, our fearless leader. And um, something I love about Shannon is just her desire to learn. Shannon was like, we can learn how to do a podcast. Like that's something that we can totally do. And so she started doing all this research. She set up um, meetings for us with people who were hosting successful podcasts. And it suddenly felt like a feasible thing. Um, and I think that that's just a, a broader testament to the idea that when you have someone who's a cheerleader or yeah. saying, yeah, we can do this, you also start to believe it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, I was, I was funny and, and I don't want to go off on a, a tangent away from this, but uh, you just made me think about this. I was listening to a podcast actually earlier today, Mel Robbins was being interviewed and she, she said, there are basically two, two kind of folks. They are, there are thinkers and then there are action people. Mm -hmm. and, and she was talking about how action people are generally more happy Mm -hmm. um, and the big difference, she said, is so something like this. An idea for a podcast comes up. There will be people who will like think about it and think of all the reasons like it can be intimidating and be fearful of it. And then there will be the folks who just say, you know what, I'm going to do it. Like, we're just going to do it and, and figure it out. And I was half convicted in that a little bit because I'm like, well, I'm kind of a thinker sometimes. But then I was like, well, no, there are some areas where I'll just say, we're going to go for it. So I applaud you all for just saying we're we're going to go for it. Um, and you've really done you've really done well with it. And um, and and I think it's also a, a testament to I, I tell I've got two teenage boys. I tell them all the time, like you live in a day where you can mm -hmm. learn anything you want to. Mm -hmm. Podcasts has been a huge piece of that like you just you you put a google search for anything like just a general topic and you're going to get a you know anywhere from a handful to tons of podcast episodes on that in addition to yeah. youtube videos and webinars and it's mm -hmm. just such a information age and i think that when, when it comes to the work we're doing mental health and um just promoting the well-being of our communities, the access that they have to information mm -hmm. today, especially folks who may not otherwise get it, is it's just invaluable. So, um, and along that line, I wonder if what the feedback has been from the community in terms of having access to that information, has, has any of the response been surprising to you or what? What has it been? I think all of it's been surprising because this felt like, well, okay, it's one thing, like if we can maybe pull it off, but are people going to listen? And it's been really beautiful and humbling to hear the responses of people who have tuned in, you know, people who listen to an episode and say, I shared this with, we had um, a superintendent share it with their school district, like all their staff. And I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> teachers nice. are listening. Teachers who are educators are, are listening and hopefully being educated in some way. And um, I think the, the really special response has been from individuals who are really, you know, a particular episode strikes a chord or I have friends who have been kind enough to listen, who have shared with me what they've learned. And I just, that makes me so happy because we've had such amazing guests who I am learning so much from in these conversations, but being able to hear what others learn is really special. And the response of people who have been interviewed is really special. There's, we have, you know, we've been fortunate enough to have some guests who are used to public speaking and are often telling their story or have written books, you know, have authored right. literal stories about their lives, but we have other people who don't have that opportunity that often. And so um, it's, that too is really special to hear someone's reflection on what their experience on the show has been and what it's meant to share and how they've shared it with uh, friends and family. And yeah, it's, it's just all been 
exciting and has reinforced for me how crucial storytelling is. We say that all the time in our ACEs work, like, you know, what we're really trying to do is help people find a space where they can tell stories. A lot of times, really, really hard stories that mm -hmm. they've been holding on to. And I think that's so healing because we are all really made to be storytellers. We're all made to be in each other's stories. And I know when you, when you interviewed me for this podcast, um, and I've done a lot of different interviews and had a lot of different conversations around ACEs in this role that I get to do. But I, I did feel um, especially comfortable in that conversation with you because I felt like some folks, they'll interview and they are just looking to have you share information that they will be that will be helpful. And that's OK. You, I felt like your heart was in this work. And when you like, and, and you were coming from it from a heart standpoint, and that's, I think it's a powerful one. It, it makes somebody on the receiving end want to like share their story It makes them more comfortable. And this, my work, I really, it's not like, to me, it is a story. Um, so I'm curious where, where that heart comes from, from you, How, what, and that, cause that was early. Like you weren't, you weren't eight episodes yeah. in when you interviewed yeah. me. So you were already very like thinking of, as you just described that process, I'm thinking, wow, she, she got good at this early from an interviewer standpoint, but really I think you have a gift for it, but I think that gift is you have a heart for mm. the subject you are um, talking about. So I'm just curious where, where your heart for this conversation comes from. Hmm. I I think I just, well, first of all, thank you. Your words mean a lot to me. So thank you for what you just shared. I think I just really feel so honored when anyone tells me anything below the surface level of their life. Like it just really feels like such a gift to share in someone's story and to be entrusted with that. Um, when you were just saying what you're saying, I was, I think I totally forgot about this, but the first job I ever wanted was to be a news reporter. Like that's what I wanted to be in elementary school. And I loved the idea of just like learning about what was happening by talking to people and ultimately realized that journalism involves a lot beyond just the conversations yes. Yes. and deciding yeah. that that was not for yeah. me and eventually found my way to social work. But I just, I love, I love to learn. And I love when that learning is done from another person, because I, I only have one worldview. I only have the years of experience from my life. I have the education I've received. That's it. And that is very, if that is all I stuck with, that would be a very limiting way to experience the world around me moving forward. And so, yeah, I just, I really just feel like thrilled when anyone wants to tell me anything. Um, yeah. But I think there's a lot to that. I think there's a lot, there's a lot of folks out there who want to experience that thrill. Mm -hmm. Like they want to be in these relationships where folks want to share information. I think that's, you know, all the way down to a personal relationship, to working relationship. Um, but I think I, I love what you said about if, if I if I didn't have the opportunity to do that, I'd just be going through this world with my worldview, mm -hmm. which is you know, shaped by the circles you've you've had in your life so far. And I'd be curious when you said that, I'd be curious what, if any, put you on the spot a little bit, like has your worldview changed? from these conversations that you've had over the last couple of years and any big ways, small ways, has there been anything along the way that has really just struck you in a way that, wow, if I hadn't had this conversation, I'm not sure I would look at the world this, this way. I don't know if there's one conversation that really shifted everything, but I, I think I could probably pull something from each conversation that has caused at least a small shift in how I'm seeing things. Um, I think an overarching theme has been, you know, when we first started 
the show and came up with the name Awareness to Action, we really in conversations about it would emphasize awareness through education or lived experience. And I think I'm consistently taken aback by how powerful those two things can be, how much a person can impact others just from pulling from their own life experience and vice versa, how much someone, when they have the tools and the education can impact without having that lived experience, you know, like both of those, and you can't really truly separate them. There's really not anyone who has just lived experience and no education on something and the opposite, but I don't know. I think I'm just consistently surprised and amazed by how much can be done. I, I'm, I'm getting stuck in my words, but yeah, what we can do with, with our awareness of either, you know, that education, you don't need the same experience as another person to make an impact. You also don't need a formal education to make an impact. Right. I, I say it all the time when we do, and it, you know, the ACEs trainings that we do and these conversations we have, have changed, changed my life. And to your point, one of the big reasons has been it's an, it's an interactive training that we do Mm -hmm. and just the nature of talking about adverse childhood experiences and, and, you know, just the, the story of our childhood, Mm -hmm. when you start talking about that to an audience, they automatically go to this place of their childhood. And then you're doing this training in a way that makes them really reflect on it in a way they probably hadn't before. And then they start sharing some of that story Mm -hmm. a lot of times. And I will tell you that over the last eight years that I've been doing this work, eight years ago, I looked at my childhood one way. Today, it's a completely different story. And it's a much truer story. And it's a much real story. Because when you start engaging with somebody else's story, um, in that setting, and I think you get that a lot when you have these conversations, mm-hmm. like you're, you're getting someone's truth, like yeah. you're getting someone's vulnerability mm-hmm. and you're suddenly in a space where that's moving, but mm-hmm. it's also very educational. Mm-hmm. Like the audience mm-hmm. does become the teacher in a lot of ways. Um, so I I get that. I think these conversations you have are stirring that up out in the, out in the community. I hope so. I, I think something that has felt very true for me in, in doing this project is how, how much we need to be stewards of each other's stories. You know, before I talked about how thrilling it is to me when someone shares their life with me. And I mean that, but it, would be really wrong for it just to be thrilling or to like be this exciting thing that I've been led into. And then, oh, you let me in, I observed, and now I'm going back out. Like, that was fun, bye. That's not, like if someone's letting me into their life story, I have to take that in. Like I owe it to them to really try and understand and to take something from it and to move forward carrying it in a way that's meaningful. I, I think it would be really irresponsible to just hop in and out of these conversations without taking it with me in a way that's educational, you know? You, um, so like I, I have goosebumps. Um, now I'm, I'm all the way back to remembering why our first conversation was so powerful to me. That was such a beautiful thing to say. Stewards of each other's stories, I promise you, that will be quoted in a future <laughs> training and presentation that I I do because um, I think I've discovered how important that is and and I don't know you can tell me like I I and you just said all that so well like I I'm afraid we do pop in and out of each other's stories too mm-hmm. much mm-hmm. Um, and. You know, in terms of the podcast and this journey you're on, you know, what, how how do we get better? Whether from your experience in this or from folks you've talked to, like what, what does a good steward of someone else's story look like? Because I'm not sure everybody knows how to do that. Yeah, 
Uh, well, I think it's a few things. Well, I think it's probably a lot of things. I think it's, I think it's, you know, kind of taking the, the harder way through, like it would be easier to hop in and out, but I think to, to commit to, you know, I, I'm going to hear this person's story. I'm going to put my, you know, put myself in a place where I can listen to it humbly and hear them, not put my own story into it, really hear them and then walk away, taking it with me, like not carrying their whole life story, but taking the lessons from what they've shared or, or taking the, the intimacy of them sharing it with me. I'm going to carry that forward rather than just taking it in and leaving it behind. And I think it also being stewards requires us to be authentic in our own storytelling. Like it would be this, for example, circling back to Shannon, my fearless leader. Yeah. One thing that I love about Shannon is she has this gentle persistence about her that got us to start this podcast because she yeah, kept she saying, does. I think this would be a good idea. I yeah. think this would be a good idea. What do you think? Mm-hmm. Shannon has been asking for two seasons that we do an episode like this where I get interviewed yeah. and I kept saying, no, 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 no. That's, I don't want to do that. And, yep. but you know what? <laughs> that's not super fair to ask people onto the show to ask them about their lives, have them tell their stories and then say, well, yeah, but I'm not doing it. You know, like it's, and beyond a podcast sphere, like that's same thing in our lives. It's not fair for me to expect or want the people around me to be vulnerable. And then to say, okay, that's so great that you were able to do that. But I actually, sorry, I'm not going to share or sorry, you, you can't get to hear this part of my story. Um, we have to be wise about who we share with and you know we have to be prudent in that way but I think being able to share our own stories authentically helps us to be better stewards of other stories because we know what it's like to be on the other side of the story sharing and if you never share your story how do you take that in you know I um again like (laughs) just got connect with this conversation so much it's only been a couple of weeks ago and and to me again, it's just the power of what these shared conversations can do. And um, I was having, I was I was worried about my one of my teenage sons, and I was like worried that he had some things going on that he just wasn't really sharing with me. And I and I like what you said too that being a good steward of the stories, being willing to take the hard way through and just to be vulnerable and open. Like I, that was not modeled for me in my life. Like it just was not my story. And that impacted all of my relationships going forward, but I've been committed to really wanting to change that direction with my boys. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I say like one of my goals in life is to be a good father. And to me, that is good father will be, if they ever have anything hard going on in their life, they can come talk to me because I've just come to place so much meaning in being able to have those hard conversations. And so I'm preparing to ask him about some of these hard things and I'm not going to share his story, but I knew in my mind, like my first step is going to have to be, I got to tell him some hard things. Mm -hmm. I have to set the table for this conversation. Mm -hmm. And the easy way out would have been, sit him at the table and say, listen, you're going to talk to me about whatever, like that doesn't work. I know it. I lived it. Um, and that, that was a really hard thing to do, to just sit down and tell him some hard details of my life. But across the table from me mm-hmm. was a teenage boy who suddenly had like, tears in his eyes. And um, when I gave him the opportunity to talk to me about, he was, he, he opened up. And so I just think that's really, that is really powerful. Um, and I, again, I just love the way you you said that and and you shared that. Um, and I, I would be curious, like what, like you appear to be a natural sort of conversationalist. You seem to be good at like, like I'm a little surprised that you were hesitant 
to get on the receiving end of this. Um, has that been challenging for you or like is, is your history one of kind of, I, I love the word intimacy. I didn't always, but I've come mm -hmm. to really love it when, because I think it does speak to connection and conversation. Mm -hmm. So was that something that came natural to you coming into this, or is that something that's grown in you the last couple of years? That is a, that is a big question. <laughs> um, Shannon gave, Shannon gave me the opportunity. So I'm, I'm <laughs> like what she talked you into it. I'm digging, I'm going. That's a great question. I think that I, if we're going way back, I, I cry a lot. That is something that anyone in my life knows about me. There's just any emotion can bring tears. And I used to hate that about myself. Like I just, it, it always embarrassed me because I cannot control it. If I, if I am feeling something, I'm crying. And sometimes it's like, just a, a ridiculous thing that has caused it. And, um, there was a turning point my first year of college where my roommates and I watched, I was watching the Harry Potter movies for the first time. And there was a character death that I feel like I've told this before on the podcast. There was a character death that maybe it was in our conversation. Was it? I, I can't remember. I don't know. I, I I, maybe on. I just imagined it, but, um, there was a character death that just, I was so sad. I, I literally missed the dining hall hours for dinner. I missed dinner because I was crying so hard in my dorm. And very shortly after, I think I was talking with a friend about how I wish I cried less. And, and they were like, well, you're just feeling things. Like you're just connecting with things. And I realized like, yeah, I cried so hard at that movie because I could feel how the other characters were feeling about that person's death. And anyways, spent a lot of time that year then figuring out like, what does it mean to feel so deeply and how can that be used for good? <laughs> and like, if that's maybe the thing I'm most embarrassed about, but also potentially my, like the best thing about me yeah. and have over time come to determine that, yes, it is sometimes embarrassing, but most of the time, like my I think everyone has a little superpower and I think that's my little superpower is feeling things. And so I think to answer your question, being vulnerable, feeling with people comes very naturally to me. Talking with people is something that makes me nervous. And I am usually very nervous before an episode. Like I have the nerves. I have, you know, the I usually am very sweaty. <laughs> I'm nervous <laughs> about talking with someone leading up to it. And then we get in the conversation and I'm like, oh, right, this is what I love. Like, I love hearing these stories. I love finding connecting points. That is like the best thing about being human <laughs> is being able to connect. And then usually by the time the episode or the conversation's over, I'm like buzzing like, Ooh, okay. What am I going to go change in the world based on this conversation and based on what I've learned? Yeah. I'm also an introvert, big time introvert. So these conversations are funny because the connection is really gets me so fired up, but the talking itself is like, all right, I need to lay down for a little bit <laughs> after this conversation. So I guess it's a mixed bag. I think, um, I think it has come more naturally over the course of doing this podcast. And I think this podcast has, has, you know, further affirmed that that is really, I think the best, the best thing about being a person are these kinds of conversations and getting to care for people and care about their stories and carrying them with me. You know, I, um, yeah, yeah, we're, 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 we're so much alike. Cause I, <laughs> like I, I, most people get surprised by it, but I'm like, no, I am terribly introverted. And I yeah. so relate to that. Um, uh, so I've done some, I did a running podcast years ago and it's still out there and I've done some other podcasting and, and most of the time it's with folks, like I had to reach, it's not friends. It's not people I know, probably a lot like you, yeah. you're interviewing people, like you don't have a, a known connection with and so there's a lot of nerves but then when I get in the conversation like there's an ease that that comes with it but that piece of um like 
just so exhausted afterwards, mm-hmm. like yeah. totally <laughs> drained. Like, no, I I get it. And 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 so and one of the things, so I did this running podcast, which originally was I'm just going to talk with runners about running, but then there's they're just developed this undercurrent, like conversation after conversation. The reason that these runners were running, that was not my intention whatsoever. Like, I just really wanted, like, it was very selfish. Like, I was much more into running at that time. I still am, but I was like hardcore. I was going to, you know, be the best older runner ever. So I was like, I'll get everybody's tips, get their training, get all their, but they're, they're, there became this human story undercurrent. Like everybody, I, I came to say everybody was running to something or from something. Mm-hmm. And I became fascinated about that. And that became really like, at, from that point, like I was like, if I got tips about running in the conversation, that's a nice bonus. I want to know your story. And I say all that to, I'm curious that like you probably went into this, having some ideas about where we want to go and what the conversations, but have there been any sort of underlining stories or underlining currents along the way that you have found yourself, oh, we really need to follow this storyline, or this is sort of a current that runs through our community that would be helpful to explore? You know, it's funny, we just recently, Shannon and I were kind of looking back on the show as a whole and talking about what has really what has stuck out from this. And I think something I anticipated to a degree, but couldn't have really prepared for is how much we would be talking about connection and community. That was like part of our goals starting out, but I I just didn't realize how relevant that would be to every single story, every type of work that we talk about here. And um, I knew before starting the podcast, how much I value community, you know, in my life and how important I think it is, you know, on a more macro scale. But I just, I just feel like every conversation has re-emphasized how absolutely crucial it is that we have strong communities, that we have strong connections to the individuals in our community and to the community as a whole and has really expanded my idea of what community building can look like, what community parenting can be, what it can, just the ways that we build one another up and help one another. Um, Yeah, I, I, I think community has been probably the most beautiful theme of the show and what community looks like for people is so different. Like that's really been interesting too, to hear how one, one person talks about community so differently than another, but at the end of the day, we're all talking about the same stuff. Cause all that anyone wants is to feel connected. And now I just feel like that's, that's what I want to do in this life is like build community, build better communities. How do I strengthen community in my own life? How do I identify it and, and raise it up and celebrate it? What does that look like on small scales? What does that look like on large scales? Yesterday, (laughs) this is a silly example, but yesterday I happened upon two groundhogs and one was in the tree, which I didn't know that groundhogs could climb. One was in the tree. (laughs) Never heard you. You just said groundhog in a tree. I looked it up. I was like, I'm pretty sure that's a groundhog. They can climb into trees for nutrients. But this one groundhog was on the edge of a branch so that he was really weighing it down. So that the branch was low enough that a different groundhog on the ground could stand on its hind legs and reach up and pull down leaves for itself to eat. And I watched them for so long. I took so many videos of them on my phone. And I thought, look at that. That's community. Yeah. <laughs> Those two groundhogs are in community. And um, I just now I just feel like that's now my brain is more wired to recognize that than it was before doing the show. And that's a huge, huge gift. Yeah, no, well, we could talk a, a long time about like my my latest um venture is into this whole idea of weathering together. Mm-hmm. And it really is about community. Like, I mean, 
and, and it's really come from these these conversations and kind of like you, like I think everybody maybe has known that relationships are healthy, mm-hmm. that a community is made up of healthy relationships. But, you know, one of the things I've come to say is that connection is the curse and it's the cure mm-hmm. and it's the curse because it's the curse because You know, in our ACEs work, we talk about um, that lack of connection, Mm -hmm. really just having all sorts of health implications down the road if you don't have it. But then the cure is that same thing as the cure. Like Mm -hmm. you can bring healthy connections into someone's life at any point and it's going to make their life healthier, better, happier. The challenge is because we, we, you know, one of the impacts of not having those connections early on is so many of us are running around having no idea how to do that. And I think that's where it gets really powerful when you, when you say, I want to be a community builder. Like, I think that's a really serious deal. Like I think more and more I'm, I'm because people do not know how to do it. And our ACEs work more and more. We're incorporating skills Mm -hmm. uh, sort of, prompts sort of arranging so we we did this aces training um in southwest virginia not long ago and we had a couple of our folks down there led us through this activity that really step by step forced us to become curious about one another Mm -hmm. and then ultimately sharing stories with Mm. another and then reporting out sort of these stories and what we had learned from one another sort of a informal podcast (laughs) but my feedback after that was when when you all were introducing this activity of like forcing us to connect I Mm. wanted nothing to do with it like everything in me was just clenching up like you said earlier you got to take the hard but then it was done when, when it was done like there was no place I would have rather been. Yeah. And so when you talk about wanting to be a community builder and and hopefully this podcast is doing that, I that it can't be understated how powerful that is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think um, building something that a lot of us haven't experienced before. So then, like, how do you do it? I think it's just taking like tiny experiences where you've seen it and felt the power of it and trying to bring that into other spaces, but there's not really a, it's all very vague. Like how do, yeah. what does it even, you know, how do you even define that? Well, and I think you're doing it with the podcast and what to me it's um, what, what I've come to believe is it absolutely starts with safe places. Mm-hmm. Most people hesitate to go in and have the hard conversations because that's never gone well. Mm-hmm. With them. Like mm-hmm. at, a lot of people have grown up where they, for many reasons, have had to hide from yeah. the hard conversations or lie to protect themselves from mm-hmm. hard conversations. And so that's, and and I, like I said, I, I share that from experience. I, I, when I had that conversation with my son, like I, I had to be very methodical about like, I have to set a safe table here because there's no other way we're going to have the conversation I want to have if I don't mm-hmm. do that. Um, so I think when you do things like yeah. tell stories about, I used to cry. I cried at Harry Potter. Now I'm crying at groundhogs and trees and leaves. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think you ought to share those videos with us. Cause that to me is, I can't picture it. I, I grew up on a farm and we hated groundhogs because they would eat all the crops and my grandpa would be shooting them. So like my image of a groundhog is very different than your playful groundhogs that I'm not 100% sure of groundhogs <laughs> in your front yard or wherever. Um, where, where, where do you hope then, like now that you've been doing this, where do you, like you're entering a new season, where do you, like personally, where do you hope this goes? When you, you did a, like I could feel it in the beginning when you were talking about just kind of how happy this has made you, how it's exceeded anything you dreamt that yeah. you could be. Like you didn't know what a podcast was. Now you're like a, <laughs> a podcast host. And where do, where do you hope that it goes in season three and beyond? I, 
Well, that's a big question too. I think I just, I hope that people keep saying yes to being interviewed. Um, that people keep entrusting us with their stories and their descriptions of their work and, and their hopes for their work and, and their communities. And I really, I just hope that people listening understand that building these connections and forming community like that is for everyone, that that is available and that there are ways for each of us to share like that little superpower I was talking about before, like there are ways to share that with the people around us, or maybe it doesn't feel like there's ways to share that with the people around us, but there are ways to share that with the world, you know, and maybe that means being in a different environment or, you know, finding the people who welcome those, those superpowers. But I just, I really feel like each of us has gifts and skills and strengths and ideas and hopes that will make a difference. We just have to figure out how, what avenue to use those. And I don't think that's an easy task, but I really hope, I really hope that hearing the stories of others about how folks have taken their awareness through, again, lived experiences or education, how they've taken that and done something with it that is meaningful. Like every person that we've had on the show has made an impact in tangible ways in their communities and the lives of those in their life. And that that is not just for the guests of our show. Like that's, that's out there. I don't know. The opportunity is there. You just have to get a little creative. Yeah. Well, it's, it's all about, you know, again, it goes back to um, a, a lot of these conversations are faith you know, you just have to trust mm -hmm. that it's going to have an impact. You could have never guessed when whatever episode it was that you did, you could have never guessed that a superintendent was going to take it back to the schools and have the staff listen to it. And that's the beautiful thing about having like, and I think that stands in our way so much. Like we get so focused on what we want this thing to equal. Like what are the outcomes we want? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm fortunate that I have, you know, this spiritual foundation to me that truly trusts and has seen like mm -hmm. the very best plans I've ever had have been far <laughs> exceeded by, you know, in my world, it's God, but, in, you know, maybe somebody else's, it's just a universal whatever, which is, which has been really helpful to me mm -hmm. because it's when you come to realize you don't have the best ideas, like you're, you're, your mission is just, like you said, just to share your gifts. You have to realize I have something. Mm -hmm. And if I put it out there, it will make a difference. I don't know what it is, but I trust that it will. And I think you, I think you um, demonstrated a lot of that. I think you all have had a lot of faith. Um, and you never, you know, that's sort of the hard part when you do this and you have conversations that hundreds listen to. You don't ever get to know fully the ripple effects and the impacts that make. So you do have to keep showing up in faith and in trust and just keep taking action, you know, yeah. awareness to action. In some place, maybe it gets reverse action to. Yeah. 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 I think I, I really enjoy that we get to highlight, like I said way earlier in this conversation, like people who are doing good work who might not have a a way to share that widely because they're putting their head down and doing the good work day in and day out. And so having their reflections on that work be available to others or even to coworkers. Like I know we've had guests who have been on here and, and really reflected on the work they're doing day in and day out, and then have been excited to share with their coworkers because we don't even always make space for that in the context of the work we're doing day in and day out with our coworkers. Like we don't always sit down and say, why does this have meaning to you? Why do you show up for this Monday after Monday after Monday? Like what, how does this connect to you? How do you, how do you find good in this? You know, we just, we do it, we do the work and that's good and important, but I think creating spaces where we can actually talk about what it means and why it matters is really important. And so I, I enjoy that part of it too, that people get to, to hear that. 
I think uh, you, you just describe when you talk about how do we do that community building thing? I've become a big fan of the word curiosity mm. because what you just described is a, like we work together, like, and we yeah. share, but, um, you know, I was genuinely curious when I asked you, when we started, like, where does your heart come from for this? Mm -hmm. Like that helps me understand what you're doing here, why you're doing it. Like I, I've learned a lot about what you know in our couple of times together. I've come to know like what you're about, but like, I want to know where it comes from. And I think that's what a lot of people, they just want somebody curious. Yeah. Them. yeah. And I think you create spaces for, for that here. And then hopefully that, again, I hope that's something that extends beyond the conversations and to other people's conversations yeah yeah and I think you're you know you're you're naturally curious I think that, again that makes you good at, at what you're what you're doing um and I think also just something else to say about this is is how I hope one of my hopes for this too is that people listening will be struck by like the beauty of teamwork and the beauty of you know, here's something I know how to do well. How can I get others in on this to make it better or to actually put this into action? You know, like the podcast or again, going back to how this started, like Shannon was really excited about the idea and she gave us the tools through her research and, and actually acquiring the tools, like the microphone and the headsets to yeah make it happen. And then we have Rebecca who just, she's like our creative girl, like always coming up with these great ideas for guests and, and clever logos and like where we might go with this. And then a season went by and I said, listen, I love hosting this. I want to do this for a long time, but I cannot keep editing these episodes because I'm not good at it. And it is so hard for me and then Denise was brought on and Denise has just knocked it out of the park with her editing and has contributed so meaningfully in that way because I literally was not prepared to do another season if I had to keep editing <laughs> because I mean, I'm sure I would have because I love this whole thing, but yeah. it would have been a real struggle. Right. right. But now it's not a struggle because right. I get to do the part that I'm most skilled at and they all do the parts that they're most skilled at. Now we have Corey on the team too. And, and she does a great job of sharing it with people. And it's just like, yeah, this wouldn't happen without a team. And so that's, I mean, that that's for anything. Like, again, we all have that superpower, but a lot of those superpowers don't work alone. Like you right. need a couple other superpowers right. to make something good happen. That's right. And that's part of the community building too, is how do I, how do I bring this to the table and who else do I need at the table yeah. to really make something happen? No, so well, so well put. I was, you know, I, and I, it came out in our first interview, like I'm fascinated by the brain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of these questions I've always had about the brain is like the brain has all these different compartments. Like there's just little rooms in the brain, even to the point where we have a left brain and a right brain that are very, that, that are very specialized in what they do. And I've always like wondered, like, why is that? Why do we have a, why isn't it just a brain? Why do I have a left brain that does all these sort of linear and logical things and a right brain that does all these touchy feely mm -hmm. presence type things. But I was listening to a conversation the other day that described it like an orchestra, which is really what you were just describing. It's like, you know, what, and I don't even know all the instruments in orchestra, <laughs> but like you have the wind section and the string section and, and they're all going to go practice on their own. Like they're going to get their part down really well so that when they come together, the conductor or the organizer has these specialties as special as they can be to then integrate them together. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking, like I've got your all, you know, one of your, I think season two pulled up here and y'all talked about problem gambling, problem gambling, reducing stigma, sharing our stories, community building, um, hope and healing, authenticity, all of these different things that if somebody would look at this, say, these are all very individual, mm -hmm. distinct conversations. 
and they are in their way, but I think what you all are doing is helping, and I know I felt it, like when you invited me on for the chance to talk about ACEs. Well, the one reason I love talking about ACEs is because ACEs is important when you're talking about community building. It is important when you're talking about problem gaming. It is important when there's no better way to reduce stigma than help people understand these things you're stigmatizing are rooted in people's childhood stories a lot of times. And so it's really pulling people together. And sometimes we can think, and, and that's our hesitation. Like, it's like, oh, wait a minute. If I come to the table with my expertise, like somehow you're going to water down what I'm doing. Like I, if I got to share, like I got less. Yeah. But really what you have, if you have somebody help them pull it all together, they're going to, they're going to take what you have and make it more. They're going to make your mm-hmm. impact grander by being integrated, being connected with all these other compartments. So I think that's really powerful what you all are doing and the way you can articulate that in in a very thoughtful way, in a sort of a strategic way. Um, And I'm not surprised, I guess Shannon's known that for a long time. Like that's kind of what we do in prevention better than some of the other things we do in prevention is we, we do reach out across the various aisles. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about, you know, the continued efforts in that with your podcast. Yeah, me too. And you're the, you're the conductor, you're the orchestra conductor. So, um, sweet, beautiful music you're making. (laughs) We're trying. (laughs) Uh, well, I know we're coming up on our hour. Um, any, like anything you want to share about, like Shannon had, I'm sure some very specific things she wanted to come out of this conversation. So like, if if we don't get it, we'll both be in trouble. So (laughs) is there anything you need to, to share or get out there to protect us both? (laughs) No, I think, um, Shannon is a, a lover of hearing people's stories and like you just said, understands the the impact of people contributing to the community differently. And I think that's what we've really talked about today is just how, I mean, I don't even know how many total episodes we have between our first two seasons, but each one's a different person doing completely different work and still contributing meaningfully for the people in their immediate sphere and their communities. And that's just, that's what it's all about. We all, you know, there are just people that have been on this show that are doing things I didn't even know you could do yeah, right. <laughs> or have partnered with others in ways I would have never thought to partner. And, you know, like there's just so much being done, so much good. And if I ever feel hopeless about where the world is going or what is going on around us as, it, you know, it can be easy to feel that way. I yeah. think I just, I can just scroll through even just the titles of our podcast. I can can think back on like, okay, so there's a lot happening. If I look at the news, there's, there's so much going on. But then if I think about all these people that I've gotten to talk to who are just every day waking up and deciding that they are going to contribute good to the world. We are, I mean, and and we haven't interviewed all of them. There are so Yeah, we just have this tiny sample of people. There are so many helpers, just like yeah. the folks we've interviewed all over the world who are choosing that. And that is what is going to keep us moving forward and moving yeah. through all the hard, st- you know, there's just, there's always, I don't know. I don't know who said it, but there's someone who said, look for the helpers. Like always yeah. look for the helpers. I think it was Mr. Rogers. Oh, well, there you go. A good, yeah. a good one. <laughs> um, there are always helpers. Yeah. And I, I think that's a beautiful, you know, it, it's you, but I, and I, I was reading a story online today, I just scrolling, um, and, and there was a uh, football player who posted something, and it was nice, it was, he, he plays for New Orleans, and his, his message was, hey, if there's any teachers who need supplies, shoot me a message, I got yeah. you, I got you covered, which was a nice thing for him to do, but, but then there were a lot of like comments and that. I don't know why I ever read them. Like I know better, but there were a lot of comments. Of course, there were many of them that said, man, that's, that's a good dude. I'm glad he's doing that. But then there were a lot of sort of comments that said, 
it's nice to see somebody do that in such an ugly world, or it's nice to see this light in such a dark world. And like, as I was reading that, I was thinking that, you know, that's what they're right. They're right. But then I like had to catch myself and say, no, they're mm -hmm. not right. This is not a dark world. It really isn't. Like, if you want to believe it, you can. But to your point, like, and you've had 30 episodes because I counted them. So, <laughs> but that, that includes mine twice. <laughs> <laughs> But you're right. Like that's 30 points of light. Like that's 30 mm -hmm. and that's 30 opportunities for you to share light. And I don't think you're sharing light because it's a dark world. I think you're sharing light because you believe in the light of mm -hmm. the world that comes across in the way you interview and the, and the way you, you share it. And, um, and I think it gives us all a chance to say, no, this isn't, the world has its challenges, but it's not a dark world. The minute we start mm -hmm. believing that, well, then we, we can't, see the light in these conversations so i encourage you to keep doing it you got a beautiful way of doing it shannon looks like a prophet you know the way <laughs> she said we're gonna do this we're gonna do this we're going to do this because it's, it's worked out really well yeah i think um well i appreciate that a lot I, and i think i really do just here's here's you asked if i have anything here's what i think i think that there is so much good happening in our communities at all times. And I think a really powerful practice can be the decision to register that good. Like when you see, I always, I always make sure I read whatever messages are outside of schools on their little like uh, boards where they can write things on their school sign, because in the summer, it's not like announcements about <laughs> the school year. It's like sweet messages of encouragement for the students that they are not in their building right now. And um, I will always stop and read flyers on lampposts because I want to know what is happening and what are people up to and what cool thing is being advertised that I don't know about, what way that someone's trying to help the community. And I think just registering, like when you see something good happening, or you see someone doing something kind or meaningful or trying to get something started that has importance, like not just seeing it, but registering it. Like the same thing as not just peeking in and saying, oh, there's something good yeah. and then moving on. But like, oh, look, that person is helping today. Like that, that if you register that in your head, you are not going to be looking at the world like it's so bad because you are daily registering good that's happening. And that is so much easier to do when we walk around our neighborhoods than it is when we like scroll through our news app, you know? And I think, but I think it's important to be informed. I'm not saying to, to stop reading the news, but <laughs> just as much as you're reading the news, I think you should be registering the good that's happening around you. Yeah, no, I've been reading a lot lately on um, anticipating beauty and mm. doing exactly what you just said, registering it. Because I, again, it's a very scientific process. Mm -hmm. the things you reflect on will become your yeah. story. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of my running these days is exactly that. Like I'm, I'm going out to run to see the beauty mm -hmm. out there and literally stop. Like, I'm not going to be in such a hurry. Like if, yeah. if I were to see groundhogs climbing trees, like I'd be videoing that too. Cause I want that not only to register, I want proof of it. Um, but I, I think that's a beautiful, yeah, a beautiful way to, to yeah. look at it. So I will. I will definitely be registering this conversation, much like our last one. So I'm excited for, I'm excited for your next season and really proud of you. Like I, especially as we've gone through this, like to know, <laughs> you even got one of them little wind things up for your mic now. Like you're, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shannon set us up with the nice, <laughs> the nice mic. You mics. are a pro. <laughs> like you'll be giving podcast lessons soon. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Well, I'm here for you and I'm just really proud of your whole, your whole team and go get them season three. Woo. Woo. And yeah, I'll, I'll interview you anytime. I took it easy <laughs> today, but next time yeah. <laughs> we'll get hard hitting. Well, I, I felt, I think I felt in season one in our conversation was the first time I felt like, okay, this is happening and I can do this. You know, I mean, when we had had great conversations prior to yours, but I really remember that being a turning point of like, all right, this is going to be okay. 
and I feel, uh, you know, grateful for, for your support along the way in these last couple seasons and, and for the project, it's really, it just, it means everything to have, to have the support of, you know, someone like you, who's, who's doing the good work and being a helper and prevention and wellness department, just, we, we remain Keep fans. So, <laughs> well, um, I I appreciate that. But like I said, I was excited when Shannon said, you know, you came to mind. Would you do it? I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I'm a I'm a Casey fan, and I'm a an awareness to action podcast fan. So, well, thank you. you. Keep doing great work. Thank you. Thanks for listening. We are truly so thrilled to be back for season three and hope you'll join us as we dive into an entire season of amazing guests and inspiring conversations. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of it.